Hey friends, welcome to another episode of Ocean Talks. I haven't made an episode in a while, so I'm gonna jump into it right away. In case you don't know me, I'm Carlos. I'm a professional drone pilot and professional photographer here in Southern California. I film, narrate, and edit everything you see on this channel. For this episode, let's take a look at some common misconceptions about great white sharks. Before we get into the list, let me remind you that while I spend most days in the field observing white sharks, whether in the water or from above, I'm not a marine biologist. So in those regards, I'm not an expert, but I do spend quite a bit of time with them and have gained a ton of insight into their behaviors, much of which helps me understand some of these misconceptions. You'll notice some of these can be partly attributed to fictitious films and media having a major influence on sharks in general. In many comments on both my social media and YouTube, you do see these voiced often. So let's take a look at just five that I see on a regular basis. Number one, they are called great white sharks, not white sharks. This is one that just keeps coming up more and more. I mean, I just said the term great white shark, but then sometimes I also use the term white shark. So which is it? The fact of the matter is the terms white shark, great white shark, or simply great white can be used interchangeably. This is because the English language is flexible based on usage. When deciding which of several usages is correct, dictionaries, they typically employ a simple tactic. Whichever usage is most common in periodicals is deemed the preferred usage. So following this logic, it would seem that great white shark would be the preferred term. But there's somewhat of an exception here. And the reason makes sense if you think about it. Have you noticed that scientists have always preferred to use the term white shark? That is the term used in studies. There is a technical and scientific explanation for this. To use the term great implies that there is a lesser species. There is no greater or lesser white shark. It's just one. So the scientific community prefers just to use the term white shark. The immediate examples that come to mind that implies multiple species by using the word great are the great barracuda and the great horned owl, for example. Now, in addition to the use of the label white shark, lots of folks will often state that it should not be called a great white because they are so dark. This is frequently coming up in my comments. I can see why folks see it this way, especially because from a drone's perspective, we only see the top, which is typically dark, gray, or sometimes black. It's the underside of the shark that it's named for, not the top side, however. White sharks are named because of one distinctive characteristic, its belly. The white underside becomes obvious when the shark swims with its mouth open or lies upside down. The dark top provides an effective counter shading for the sharks. So white sharks, like many other shark species, are named for these prominent features, like the hammerhead and the thresher, which also follow that same pattern. Ultimately, there's nothing wrong with using the term great white shark, white shark, or simply great white interchangeably. That's what I do. But then again, I'm not exactly a scientist. Number two on the list, great white sharks can smell a drop of blood from a mile away. This one is pretty popular, but the reality is that it's just not necessarily true because there are too many factors involved outside the shark's control. Things like water currents and the speed of water transporting odors can vary. White sharks do indeed have a specialized sense of smell, and one study suggests that they can detect a single drop of blood in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. That's still pretty impressive. Their sense of smell is exceptionally sensitive to specific odors that are released from food sources, predators, potential mates, as well as human-caused disturbances. But how far exactly can they detect blood? We don't know, at least not yet. But we do know that smell is very important. The olfactory bulb used to process smells accounts for 18% of the total brain mass of a great white shark, the most of any shark species. This drop of blood misconception is one of these that popular movies and media are largely to thank for, but it's largely overstated. Number three, great white sharks give birth to pups and care for them until they are ready to be on their own. There is a traditional belief that mom, regardless of species, cares about her babies and teaches them how to survive before finally graduating to being on their own. Orcas do this, big cats, and many fish do. However, the level of parental care among fish species varies widely. Some fish species exhibit significant care for their offspring, while others provide little to no parental involvement. Great white sharks are the latter. Once the eggs hatch inside the mother, she gives birth to live pups. 
after birth, there is no evidence to suggest that great white sharks provide any parental care or protection for their offspring. The pups are essentially on their own from the moment of birth and must fend for themselves, even against other white sharks. They are born with fully functional teeth and are capable of swimming and hunting shortly after birth. This lack of parental care is a common trait among many shark species as their reproductive strategy often involves producing a relatively large number of offspring with minimal investment in each individual. It's kind of sad if you think about it, right? But sharks have been around much longer than any of us, so they might be onto something. Number four, white sharks sense boats and move out of the way. They can't get struck. This is one misconception I get often, especially in the comments of my videos. I believe it's a legitimate misconception. After all, it's well known that sharks have super senses when it comes to hearing, vision, and electroreception, among others. But this is one I can speak directly about because I have so much experience observing sharks near boats. I've yet to see a shark react to a boat in a fashion that indicates it sensed it long before it got too close. In fact, I've seen boats on many occasions zip right over them without the sharks appearing to have tried to evade. Then there's the countless injuries I've documented that indicate surface strikes and obvious prop strikes. It is reasonable to think that a shark would move out of the way, but a boat traveling at a high rate of speed in a known shark nursery, for example, is something that can be avoided. Here in Southern California, there are areas known as shark nurseries. These areas do get boat traffic. Some boats are even there to get a glimpse of a shark. However, zooming through this very area just doesn't make sense. I always ask, if this was a whale nursery, would the boats be speeding through it? Likely not. But because it's sharks, the areas are treated a little differently. It's just something to think about. Okay, so reason number five. This is the one most likely to spark debates. The misconception, humans are on the menu. This is the one that needs a lot of nuance. First, let's acknowledge this. Have sharks consumed humans? Yes, that much is evident. Given some of the attacks of the recent past and the videos that have swirled around the internet this year, I wouldn't blame someone for saying humans are indeed on the menu. But again, we need nuance, lots of it. Great white sharks are wild animals. They are unpredictable, large predators with really big teeth. However, are white sharks actively hunting humans at a rate high enough to definitively state that humans are indeed on the menu? No, the math just doesn't support it. Rather, the more realistic approach is one that is more based in facts. So can white sharks eat a human? Yes. Are they actively in pursuit of humans as a menu item? Thankfully for humans, it appears they are not. Consider this. Every year, millions upon millions of humans enter the ocean, and yet we get at most 5 to 15 fatalities per year, and less than a handful can be determined consumptions. The number isn't high enough to justify categorizing humans as a menu item. Great white sharks are not actively hunting humans, but when conditions are right or wrong, depending on your view, fatalities involving consumption do occur. Us humans, we're not exactly agile water-going creatures. In fact, if a great white shark, a creature that has evolved to near perfect predatory effectiveness, so wanted to, they could have easy meals on just any beach in the world because there's so many humans there. Humans who, as you've seen in countless of my videos, don't often know they are there. We wouldn't have just a dozen fatalities a year. It would be exponentially higher. Now, 2023 saw a spike in fatalities, but that's a topic for another day but it's still a very low number when you take it into full context. The nuance is in accepting that they are wild animals in their domain while at the same time acknowledging that they are not specifically targeting humans. I often look at the subject in comparison to grizzly bears. They too are big animals with big teeth. In fact, between 2020 to 2022, there were eight fatal grizzly bear attacks in North America. From 2015 to 2019, there were seven. But does the public consider all grizzly bears as man-eaters? I would, I would say no, but they are considered dangerous. And like most wild animals, they don't want anything to do with humans. That I can attest to. I see it all the time in my footage. I understand the fear people have of sharks. I have a fear of snakes. Growing up in a farm, I was so scared of rattlesnakes, for example. 
I still am, but I learned to leave emotion out of it and base my assessment on observation and reality. Those are calculated factors that I have control over. For great white sharks and sharks in general, the reality is they aren't bloodthirsty creatures. Instead, they are simply animals surviving in an ever-changing environment. The main element in all of this may be the human decision-making process. If you decide to swim near a whale carcass, for example, that decision can significantly change the outcome by elevating the chances of you being attacked. The decisions we ultimately make near them can have consequences. I recently returned from a trip to the Farallon Islands. Now, would I jump in the water there? Absolutely not. Thanks for watching.